All right, welcome everyone to FCI Live, our fall 2021 series. We're on the last day of the series and we're very excited to be presenting the Delhi Weather Report with the Seven Roots Consulting team featuring Kevin O'Donnell, who is a deli specialist. You guys asked for this one. There's a lot going on with prepared foods. And luckily for us, Seven Roots offered to give their time to give you guys a little update on what's going on with prepared foods in co-op that you should know about. So we're excited to have them here today. Please welcome them. Hey, guys. Hello. 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 We go. All right, are we on? Are we ready? I'm turning it over to the experts. You are on, Heather. All right, perfect. Hello, welcome. Yes, you'll see our team. We're the ones with the, the great hair, thanks to our, our background. So thank you everybody for coming. <laughs> uh, we know uh, many of you, but uh, for those of you we don't know, we are Seven Roots and we partner with folks to provide design operation support for food co-ops. So we're all here again, as always, because we believe in healthy food and community ownership and the co-op model. We're kind of, you know, co-op nerds. We are a worker co-op ourselves. So today we're going to bring you the prepared foods weather report, uh, the deli, daily deli weather report, uh, if you will. And Kevin O'Donnell is our meteorologist this afternoon, and <laughs> we're here to be his co-anchors at uh, the co-op news desk. So Nicole, uh, we're going to introduce ourselves. Take it away. Hello, everybody. My name is Nicole Klimek, and I provide store planning and design, programming, equipment specifications, and interior design for Southern Roots. And I'm gonna give you a really fun fact. Actually, it's just to make everybody hungry. Um, my favorite thing at a prepared foods deli co-op is gluten-free carrot cake. I have celiac and I love carrot cake and I can never find really good stuff. Um, and I have found the best in um, Valley Natural in Minnesota actually. Ooh, that's a good one. All right, so if, if you happen to have folks out there, everybody joining us, a favorite prepared foods item at a co-op somewhere, toss it in the chat. It's just for fun. All right, Joel, you're up next. Yeah, I'm Joel Kapischke. I do governance and project management at Seven Roots. And my favorite prepared food item would probably be a chocolate chip cookie at whatever co-op I'm nearest to. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I can relate. <laughs> Kevin, how about you? I'm Kevin O'Donnell. I'm the prepared foods and store operations specialist. And I'm really pretty simple, but I'm picky. I really enjoy a good cup of coffee and I drink it black. So I, it's gotta be good. All right. I like it. Uh, all right, so I am Heather Lazikis. I work in branding and marketing with Seven Roots. And uh, one of my favorite foods is the gluten-free peanut butter cookies at Ocean Beach Co-op. Um, they like crumble, they fall apart in your mouth. They're so good. So there's a lot of good stuff out there, but I love those. Um, so yeah, yeah again, Heather could spend the rest of the hour talking about those I know. I'm like, mm -mm, okay, stop. <laughs> Stop talking about the cookies. Um, but yeah, so again, housekeeping is mostly just keep yourself muted, throw questions in the chat when you have them. If we can and it makes sense, we'll stop and, and answer questions as we go. But we're also going to have time at the end. Uh, so we think we'll have plenty of time to, to discuss anything that you're pondering. So Kevin, you're going to kick us off today. What's up? I am. So we're going to keep you busy in the chat right now with a little icebreaker. So I have a question for you. What does everyone listen to, but no one believes? Ooh. Ding, 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 yeah. Ding, ding, the ding, news. Ding. All right, Chris, I like it. Politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't name any specific ones. <laughs> <laughs> Lies. Ooh, right. You have no choice. <laughs> my board. Ooh, oh my board. Ouch. <laughs> oh my gosh. Parents. Okay. So we, we need to move on here. So keep, <laughs> keep, keep putting them in there. But the answer is the weather reporter. Ooh, 
Kevin, this doesn't bode well for you today. Uh, so, all right. No, it doesn't. What, <laughs> so what's the scoop? Why, why should we believe you, Kevin? Well, I always ask myself that question too, but um, we've had a year and a half to watch the COVID tornadoes course. There's a lot we can't predict, but as we settle into our new COVID reality, there are some trends that we're seeing in terms of consumer behavior and how it impacts operations. The operational model has changed significantly and is pointing to how we operate with less resources and produce more. So today we're gonna to try and address that. And I'm gonna brag about my coworker, Kevin, for a minute. He has been in food service for his entire career. He's actually a um, trained chef from Cornell and is the smartest person I've ever met in terms of prepared food. But he's also the operations manager at Hunger Mountain Food Co-op um, in Montpelier, Vermont. And he's our weatherman because, or our meteorologist, because he's uniquely positioned. He has this deep understanding and expertise of pre prepared foods, but also the daily hands-on experience to really enhance that um, innate knowledge. Absolutely. And as Kevin and the rest of us uh, work with you today, uh, we're aware that some folks uh, both here and who may watch this later uh, are in different stages. Um, you may actually have a, a deli, uh, prepared foods. You may have an open co-op. You're up and running. You may be early in the planning stages. You may be stage two. You may be stage three. You might be like Louisville where you are getting close, really close. You can, um, you can see that finish line in a couple of months. So we're going to try to straddle all of that. But if you've got a specific question, again, toss it in the chat and, uh, and hopefully we'll get to it and know that we're going to try to address all of the groups that are here. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to start off and we are actually going to turn to the History Channel for just a moment. So, you know, adjust your dials or your antennas, whatever needs to happen. So uh, we're going to talk about the the role of the prepared foods department and and what's that what that has been in our co-ops historically. So essentially, when we look at prepared foods or the deli, uh, it's always been a huge differentiator for us as co-ops and a really large contributor to co-ops revenue. So the department could also be a gateway frequently for co-op customers who weren't our usual co-op customers, right? So fresh, healthy foods, meals on the go, those things often, they would appeal to everyone and anyone. It wasn't just the core people that we would often see. So now that we've had a year and a half of COVID under our belt. Um, what we're seeing is that these departments are actually still trying to find, we're still trying to find our footing in prepared foods. And that's something that we're seeing in co-ops that have been around for 50 years and co-ops that are young and, and still kind of working out the kinks. So it's become really challenging to operate prepared foods departments and our realities as operators have shifted. And at the same time, our customers' expectations and their standards haven't. So that's sort of part of what we're gonna look at here today. It's a tough spot. Frankly, we could all really use a crystal ball. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think there are lots of you, especially for those of you who have a store right now, you really wish you had one, um, but, but we don't. So that's, that's like spoiler, I'm sorry. We're not bringing one to the table today, but we're gonna talk a little bit about the big picture and uh, kind of the foundation for, our, for what you know we're working from. So we really wanna cover the following today. What factors are affecting food co-ops, the current trends in prepared foods, um, how we got here with our prepared foods and how to strategize for future expectations. Now, what are we up against? There are a number of factors that are impacting our prepared foods departments. Some of them are the same things that are impacting us at home and in our personal lives. Um, and these are a few that we see as major contributors to what's going on in the prepared foods, what's causing prepared foods to shift and how we've seen that happening recently. So today in America, we're experiencing climate change. 
there's indisputable evidence of our climate changing, right? We've got wildfires out west, we've got uh, more powerful storms, multiple national disasters, hurricanes, flooding, things like that. And along with all that water, we also have drought. Um, so the water isn't, isn't coming in even doses where we want it. So there's a water crisis. So uh, wildfires impact that as well. And this has meant water rationing. And that's having a negative impact on crops and, and in fact, the entire agricultural infrastructure. So that's happening. Second, shrinking labor pool. There's, there's labor pressure like we've never seen before multiple things have come together to create this critical shortage of employees. Of course, COVID, um, many different COVID related factors. I think we're all familiar with COVID, so we won't go down into that detail. Um, immigration restrictions that are, that are in place right now, uh, less free movement of people um, means, means the labor pool is pinched there as well. And there's also been extended unemployment benefits. And although we're not sure how much that's affected labor pool, possibly um, there's some anecdotal evidence, although the latest report um, that came out after the extended benefits ended showed there was no uh, surge in job applications like people were predicting. And so maybe instead of the un unemployment benefits, it maybe the factor is that actually a portion of the workforce is kind of opting out of the current paradigm. So um, whatever it is, it's affecting the labor pool. And then also we've got inflation, um, maybe about 4% right now. Supply is shrinking. We'll get into that more later. Demand is increasing for a variety of consumer goods, including groceries, including related things that affect groceries. So does anyone, here's another chance to put stuff into the chat. They don't have a sense for how these conditions are affecting our business. Affecting the food co-op grocery world. Any thoughts on that? We are open to hearing the wisdom in the room here. We of course have our own ideas. Supply shortages, staffing shortages. Yep. Yeah. Yes, and Thanks, yes. JQ. Increased prices. Yep. We're seeing that. <clears throat> All right. Well, if anyone else wants to weigh in, um, thank you, Kim. Thank you, JQ. Um, so this is how we're seeing the effect and impact of those things. So those factors we talked about, climate crisis, labor, inflation, they're all impacting our industry in a number of ways. And specifically, we're seeing a couple different trends. Supply chain or supply chain disruption higher cost of goods, uh, lower margin and profitability, uh, which means what Mainly we need to raise our prices in order to accommodate, um, higher wages and recruitment challenges. And we're gonna dig into these with a little more depth. Kevin, can you speak to the disruption in our supply chain for the co-ops? Sure. Um, well, you know, producers and distributors are in the same boat that we're in. They can't find employees and if they can't find employees, it's hard to fulfill the, the orders and the distribution piece to their customers. And so when that happens, it causes disruption in delivery. So we're on the ground, you know, sometimes in the co-op world these days, uh, we don't know if we're gonna get our, uh, our order or not. Um, and if we do, we may not get it at the time we expect to get it. So. It's, it's causing a lot of havoc on the ground. And, and because of that, it's leading to double digit um, increase in out of stocks on our shelves. You walk through our stores, there's a lot of out of stock, stock signs, you know, apologizing, and it's all due to this disruption in the supply chain. Wow, okay. Um, and how does this affect our cost of goods? Well, again, it's a, it's more of a basic economic premise, um, which our entire economy is built upon. It's with increased demand and shrinking supply, the basic premise is the prices go up. And when prices go up, it puts stress on our margins and our profitability. So margin profitability pressure means we need to raise our prices? It's gonna put the pressure on it 
on us to raise prices. And because we all know what margins we need to make in order to be profitable. And when those margins start to shriek, shrink, it puts our profitability in jeopardy. So we, we have to consider that. But when we consider that, please also consider that it compromises your price perception in the community for the co-op. And it also will affect inclusivity and accessibility. You may be cutting out people who now can't afford to shop there. Okay, so what about recruitment challenges and all the higher wages that we're seeing? Well, again, we're, we're competing. It's, it's almost, it's like an arms race. We're competing with all the other hospitality companies for you know, semi-skilled and non-skilled labor. And it, you know, we have to raise wages in order to, to fill those jobs. And as we start to raise the wages, um, it's, you, you get to a point where you say, I still can't fill it, but I also can't pay that wage. And it puts a tremendous amount of stress on the existing staff to do more. So as I'm thinking about, we've got, we've got the pressure on, on margin and profitability and, and, and this is not, I'm not the person you hire to help you with your finances and your operational stuff. But as I think about this, I think about, all right, well, what all goes into margin and profitability? It's like cost of goods, which we've already talked about. We have very little control over um, wages, which we don't want to lower. And there are lots of outside forces pushing them up. Um, and then we've got prices, which again, we don't want to raise. And that really just leaves like, and I know we're going to, this is what we're getting to, but I wanted to kind of do this for myself, really leaves just like, all right, around the edges, operational efficiency is, is about the only thing left that's really in our control. So yeah, I just wanted to clearly kind of, yeah, not, not easy. That was great. Thank you, Joel. Um, yeah. So yeah, as we're seeing this, exactly, we're seeing these big shifts, like Joel saying, like Kevin's outlining. And again, back to our customers, they still want a lot of the same things from us. They want speed. They want a quick shopping trip, right? They want convenience, both in the products we're delivering to them and in their experience at the store. And they want choice. They want choices on the shelves. So the other thing we're seeing is that shopping patterns are getting closer to pre-COVID. So for a while there, right, we were seeing pantry loading. That's what they were calling it in the news, where people were going less frequently and they were loading up a cart. And now what we're seeing is that that's, that's kind of going back to what it was before, which is lower basket size, and higher customer counts, meaning people are coming in more frequently and they're buying a little less. That often means that prepared foods might be a bigger part of the equation in terms of what they're looking for from us. And so that's all well and good, but as operators, we're not positioned right now to do all of the things that we are able to before and customers don't necessarily even if they understand it, they don't want it. They don't like it, right? They want that same level of service, the same options that they had before. So it puts us in a tough spot. And of course, there is so much that's unknown. Uh, if there's one thing we all know that the last 18 months has, has pounded into us, it's that we can't predict the future. So how can we be proactive with these potential challenges in our prepared foods department and frankly, our other revenue producing departments. Ah, and this is why you're here, right? We're gonna tell you the answer to all of these problems. Uh, wow. yeah, even, even climate change. <laughs> um, you ready? Yeah, here it Drum is. Roll. <laughs> stay flexible and stay focused. So we're gonna talk about that in three primary categories in your programming and menus, your operational considerations, and your physical space. And we'll go into how we can stay flexible and focused uh, a little more in depth in each of these. All right. 
So Kevin, how do programming, which I'll, I'll quickly talk about programming. Um, we've talked about this before, but for those of you who might not be familiar, your programming is what you're selling and how you're selling it. So just a little, a little fact there going into this, but how do programming and menus factor in? Kevin, help us out. Well, so here's an important piece to remember. During COVID, we trained all of our customers to go to grab and go. And we did this because we, we shut down our food bars. So, um, and in the past year, st statistics support the fact that grab and go surged in popularity for those obvious reasons. So it's, it's right now, it fits that mode that it's convenient, it's easy and provides choice for our customers. So, and while we all have, or, and some of you don't, but some of us have food bars that are sitting empty, or if we, we put them back into, um, into service, a lot of customers are not willing to embrace that right now. They're still a little shy of that, that whole concept of dishing out food that people are playing with all day. So, so, and then for the startups or the newly opened stores, made to order isn't really realistic for most of you, especially, you know, in the new stores where it takes a tremendous amount of labor, labor to, to do made to order. And you don't have those resources at this point. But on the brighter side, self-service, coffee, pastries, things like that, they're still here to stay and they're, they're going great. So I would recommend that you look to add more choices in grab and go, put more resources there to keep it full. And if you can keep it full all the hours during the day, it covers up a lot of, it covers a lot of the majority of what the customers are looking for. So, and then lastly, you know, I would highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's not the best word in the co-op world, but I think you need to look to outsource more wherever possible. Well, and I mean, it might not be the best word the way we perceive it, but there's outsourcing can be a really positive thing, right, Kevin? So like it could mean teaming up with other local businesses. It's, it truly can be about that care for community principle that is like at the core of what we're looking to do, right? We can be feeding business to other food service folks and and also filling our customers' needs at the same time when we look at outsourcing as an option. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. All right, so operations. What, what do things look like here, Kevin? How can we impact it? Well, so the key here is to be more efficient. And so in order to be more efficient, you have to use uh, the systems that uh, are designed for your operation. So that's production schedules, PAR stocks. Um, how do you use your storage efficiently? And, and it even goes down into the nitty gritty of how you make a turkey sandwich. Uh, the minute details can make a big difference to the bottom line. And in addition, there are levers that you can pull that might be, might be visible to customers. Things like your department service hours, how long the coffee is kept out every day, or on a repl replenishment uh, side, if sandwiches run out at 6 p.m., do we make more today or do we wait tomorrow? Um, so if you're in the process of developing your store, both programming and operational considerations are, are critical. And these factors really should be worked into your initial program build out because let's face it, details matter right now. Right. They matter to customers and they matter to us. So, so it sounds like there are kind of two sides here. There's the operational stuff that customers aren't really seeing this, but it's more like, you know, Chris was just saying that pinch um, that we're feeling when we're trying to operate these departments. It's all internal, but then ultimately there might be factors that we can use to impact that that would be customer facing. And that might be things like, you know, when and how things are going to be on the shelves, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Cool. Uh, physical space. Well, and this is the last component of this. So 
if you're on the cusp of designing and building a store, we should call out that this applies to the design too and the prepared food space, including the kitchen. So, you know, Nicole's the expert here. So Nicole, when you look at this, what are you seeing through your lens? Well, the first things I try to stress to people when we're designing kitchens is to program, like Kevin and Heather were saying, it really is critical, especially now and you know, even more as a startup because you don't have um, that operational experience and data to draw with from yet. So when we're thinking about designing the space, we need to maintain flexibility, uh, both on the retail floor and in the back of house, like production space. And we need to accommodate customer, um, like the shifting trends that are happening as we move forward and how to kind of meet those expectations. Great, so essentially we're kind of, we're building it so that it meets our needs now. And then we, we have options into the future mm -hmm. because who knows what's coming next? If there's one thing that the last two years have taught us. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So, uh, well, so it feels like we're, we're kind of feel like we're dishing out a lot of doom and gloom. We did want to sort of highlight a bright spot in the, the long range forecast here. I guess the farmer's almanac, if you will. We came up with so many weather puns, by the way, when we were working on this. <laughs> Really we fun. couldn't bring them all in, but uh, anyway, uh, so we do have some advantages as co-ops, though, when it comes to operating and competing in the retail prepared food space. Kevin? Yeah, so 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 we're in a pretty good position, um, I feel, and I, I think a lot of other people feel, that we can out, outrun this storm. And, and, and there's a couple things that make us different. I mean, we use a lot of local vendors and we have a lot of local partners. And this insulates us from the supply chain issues that some of the larger conventional stores are having. Um, we're also independent. So we can actually respond to what our community needs are. I mean, we're nimble enough to do that. And, and, in, and, and in most cases, especially for the, for the new startups and the just open stores, it's doable to achieve our goals, especially if we've pivoted to meet the current trends. You know, we should be more agile than the big box stores and capable of staying ahead of the storm. And let me add this. I mean, that's why you potentially hire experts to actually look at those trends and help you interpret them. Can I, can I bond in here? <laughs> yes, exactly. please, always. They told me to butt in if I really felt it. So I'm going to say it because it's easier for me to say than them. Getting prepared foods right right now is more critical than ever. And we haven't had a lot of startups that have opened successful stores with successful delis that did not hire deli expertise. I say this coming from deli background. I was started as a deli manager, ended up the GM. It takes a lot of specialized expertise to design these programs, the equipment you're gonna to need to not overbuy, to buy the right thing, to design it for efficiency. So you need less staff. This is just, this is me, FCI speaking. <laughs> this is this is not a place to cut corners now more than ever. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, JQ. Thanks, JQ. Right, and, and actually we're, we're talking with someone right now who has the expertise, but they reached out to us because they're like, I don't have the bandwidth. I'm trying to run a, I'm trying to run a whole co-op here. Mm -hmm. um, so, all righty. So what we don't know, I'm not sure why I got this slide, but okay. <laughs> so um, we don't have a crystal ball. There are lots of things we don't know. Um, so, um, but these are some constants. We, we don't know how consumer habits are going to continue to evolve. We don't know what labor availability and cost is, is specifically going to look like. Indeed, as some things change in the global economy um, and in the U.S. economy, things may actually get better for us. So but we'll, we'll have to see. We'll just have to keep our eye on it. Uh, supply chain. How and when will it recover? Uh, good question there. How will COVID progress? Um, could something else make this list? Um, sharknadoes, aliens, I don't know. <laughs> we, you know, 
two years ago, we didn't know COVID was coming. So right now, we don't know might, what might come two years from now. But there are things that we do know. Um, one, wages aren't going down. Um, and unpredictable climate events are going to continue to impact the supply chain. However, hopefully the impacted industries will develop strategies to mitigate that, but it will still affect us. And for the foreseeable future, our models do rely on prepared foods as a part of the program mix. So to quickly review this, when our prepared foods department face changes or challenges, these are the places we want to look for answers to that. And that's programming and menus, look, look local and outsource potentially, simple is always better. Operational considerations, look for places where you can be more efficient. Low hanging fruit, such as cross training staff so that they can do multiple jobs. And physical space, how do you stay flexible with all the shifts in the operations and in the supply chain? All righty. So what does this mean for startups? So if your plans are over, I don't know, six or 12 months old, you might need to review and refresh them. I know that sounds like, oh, we just did this. And so depending on where you are, it doesn't mean you need to do it right now, but you need to be aware that, that some of those plans made even recently didn't know how to take into account for COVID and, and some of these other pressures we're seeing. So those plans didn't. So some changes to wages, for example, have been really recent in the last six months. So you're gonna want to, at, at the correct time, look at reviewing, refreshing your pro forma, your market studies, your programming, again, looking at what you're selling, how you're selling it, and your physical designs. So, so we're really trying to stay high level here, but, but quickly for the, for the stores that are open already, here's a few tips. Um, look to outsource more where possible. It's a great, it, as Heather said previously, it's a great opportunity to team up with other local businesses. Focus on the best sellers or the never out lists. Um, customers have told you through their sales that they want these items. So prioritize them in your production schedules. Reevaluate your hours and services. Know your busiest times and manage your resources and accommodate those busy times. Um, there's a need to stay on top of pricing and margins. Um, again, going back to details matter, staying on top of your cost of goods sold and a and adjusting your pricing accordingly is really important to your profitability. Um, one thing that we haven't talked a lot about is you need to maintain morale for both your staff and your customers. You know, offering sales incentives for your customers to, you know, that helps them to keep coming back to the store and, and quenches some of that, I, I need this. And for your staff, you know, some maybe nice touches, incentives like lunch, provide a lunch every once in a while or increase the staff discounts. You know, it's gonna ease some of the anxiety with your staff. Um, and then lastly, when you do make changes, it's really important to have clear messaging on any of those changes, both internally and externally. So you, you gotta tell your staff you're gonna do this and you gotta communicate it to your customers. Absolutely. And so to recap, here's what we covered today. What factors are affecting food co-ops? The current trends in prepared foods, how we got here with our prepared foods, and how to strategize for future expectations. Okay. Ooh, so um, I see a couple of you have anticipated and done, done as we asked. You toss some questions in there. So um, first one, Wasatch, thank you. We've been talking a lot about partnering with other locally owned businesses that do things well. What does a partnership look like? How does a co-op make money when another business is doing the work? These are really good questions. Mm -hmm. Heather, do you have some thoughts? 
I have some thoughts and Kevin, I think you'll probably know this like the back of your hand, but uh, so we're, th I think we're looking when we're talking about partnerships right now for prepared foods, we're essentially talking about that outsourcing that we're, we're thinking of. So, and if you want to clarify, if that's not the case, uh, Wasatch, please chime in. Um, but, you know, so basically if you go to your local store and they're selling, say, cookies from a local bakery or uh, noodle bowls from a local restaurant, that kind of a thing. So that's sort of what we're what we're thinking about. Kevin, do you want to explain what that like process looks like? Sure. So to the question of how do we make money doing that? Well, um, yes, your your margins are going to be less on that. And, you know, the vendor is going to make some money on that. But what we've done is we've eliminated the labor resource there. We didn't have to make it. And if you think about the chocolate chip cookies, um, we might be spending $15, $18 an hour for somebody to make chocolate chip cookies, whereas we can buy them for two bucks for multiple ones. And so we're still going to make some money on it. And we can put those labor resources someplace else to potentially do packaging or you know we're the work on the never out list and you know other items where we produce those in-house so you can you can make money you're just m moving the um you know the pendulum a little bit of how you do it so to recap that your your cost of goods will be higher on an outsourced product but you're you're not putting any labor into it so that's what and, and you're getting free marketing because this local partner, this other business wants sales as well. So they're going to be promoting their business and saying, hey, you can get it here at the co-op. So not only are you going to get that marketing piece, when they come in, they're going to shop the whole store or at least have the opportunity to get some impulse items on the way out. So you're going to make money that way as well. Right. So I, I saw that you put in. Double down. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Heather. I was going to say, to double down on that same thing, um, what it also does is, you know, if you're a new business, uh, nobody knows who you are, right? You know, your, your owners might, but they don't know to trust you yet. But if you're carrying a product from another business that they already know and trust, it builds in that sort of familiarity from the get-go. Right. Sorry, Joel, I, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, I see that you put in, you're specifically talking about olive oil from We Olive, bulk with a bulk food business. Um, I am I am pretty sure that you can find a price point where they're going to be happy knowing they've got a bulk customer and it's a price that you'll be happy to pay. There'll still be room for a markup and you can still provide that good product to your customers. It should be a win, win, win for them, for you, for your customers. But that's a great question. And not only just question. selling it, like you can also use it in your deli. There are certain products where it's like, you can say that you are sourcing your ingredients locally and using the olive oil, but then you can also go buy it in the bulk section. So it's kind of like a double whammy. Yeah. Okay, nice. That's great. Okay. Uh, Louisville, great question. Can you talk about ways to leverage seasonal surplus and seconds from local farms to save costs? That's a great, great question. So first of all, in prepared foods, if you have the opportunity to buy seconds and you're going to change the tomato into salsa, you should never buy the top quality. Seconds make sense. I mean, it's just, it's good practice. It, it helps reduce your cost of goods sold. Um, and seasonality, um, that's where programming comes in. If you have seasonal menus, and you can rotate different items into your programming that are based on season, um, that's ideal. And so, which leads to, you know, we don't need to go down this rabbit hole, but that's why they have cyclical menus uh, when we talk about programming, uh, just based on what's available in your local market. And again, that will help insulate you against some of these other disruptions in the supply chain. That's a great question. Excellent. Um, what is the feeling about open salad bars? Well, it's a mixed bag. 
Lois. Yeah. I mean, it is like, depending on where you are and, and kind of how communities are feeling, there are a lot of people who aren't interested in going there. And there are some people who are just like digging in with the tongs. <laughs> I think, you know, it's, it's, it's more on, on the first end, you know, that, that lots of people are sort of hesitant, but Kevin, what else would you say there? Well, you know, here's the, here's the real trap challenge. I mean, so if you don't have a salad bar, that means you have to make salads and put them in your grab and go. Right. And you potentially only can put, you know, a half a dozen or, or so salads in there at, at best because you don't have the labor to, to produce them. So it's that conundrum that you have. You, you, can, you can produce less and put them in grab and go or let the customer make their own. And, and it is a mixed bag. Uh, the people that are comfortable with it, keep doing it because you know, they can get the dressing they want. They can get the mixed greens they want. They can get the add-ons they want, which if, they, if you make it in a grab and go, you can't. So, and the unique thing about the co-op community I, they're pretty passionate about, you know, making their own salads. They haven't accepted the hot food piece yet, but I see a lot of people coming in uh, into our store um, as soon as we open uh, to make their own salad for lunch when they're going to work. Yeah, and a lot of that you really do cover during programming. So when you're going through your prepared foods programming, your store planner and deli consultant are going to be looking at trends in your community, your demographics, other programs that are offered by you know local other lo local stores or local restaurants, and all of that. And I would say like just knowing Grand Rapids, my grandma lives there. Um, love it. Uh, lived there myself once. Uh, it would totally be something that I think Grand Rapids would embrace. Great. Oh, good question. Yeah, I've, I'm seeing a, a variety of change in behavior. Um, you know, now that like everything, you know, it's very clear, it's, it's transmitted much more airborne than contact. Uh, some places are still like all about hand sanitizer, all about, you know, all that, which is, you know, not, never a bad thing in food service. <laughs> <laughs> to be like really extra clean. Um, but some some folks are, yeah, way into the, yeah, it's all good. All right. Um, what packaging is being used for all the grab and go? Oh, this is a great question. This is a great um, question. Yeah, I know some co-ops are are committing to going, um, you know, to leaving behind single use plastics, you know, in in the next few years. Um, hopefully more businesses will start to do that and we'll start to figure out more solutions, but it's still tricky. Are we seeing any good sustainable solutions for this yet? It's tough. It is really tough because there's not, there's not a lot out there that's not cost prohibitive. Um, so that's, that's the difficult part is like walking that line. Like, do you want people to come in and buy the product? Or, or not, or, or, you know, or do we, are we going to put it at a price point where it makes it hard for them to do that, to tip them over there? Kevin, what do you got? I saw you. Well, ready. you know, the, the other thing that, you know, when it's, it's a great question, but one of the, one of the pieces is we've, we're in the same situation with packaging that we are with everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. The supply disruption. <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we're having a hard time just to get what we normally use right now. Right. So, so even that's a little inconsistent. Like you're seeing stuff, you know, the things I normally buy in a round tub are now in a square container and, you know, everything's sort of a little different because yeah, everyone's in scramble mode. Yep. Yeah. It's, and you know, and it's, it's one of the things that we, we would love to, to focus on. But you know, it's it's really hard when you're just trying to make your business work. Um, you know, it, it's an important concept, but we haven't. Everybody's just focusing on on the supply piece right now, and and companies aren't really doing the uh, development research to supply us with options. Right. Well, because their supply and their their labors probably feeling the same thing that we're feeling as well. Um, exactly. But I would say like. I would recommend um, your general manager, even if you know someone right now, like get in and have a relationship with any local um, packaging suppliers. 
So like up here in Grass Valley, we have Cogent, you know, and they provide for all of Northern California. Um, so they're going to be able to tell you like what their best sellers are, what they're going to be able to get in, what their predictable stock is going to be. Um, and then they can kind of work with you on what's going to be consistent enough for your products. Great. Um, so yeah, Kim, I think it's, I think that's the, that's the best advice. And I think for all of us, it's, it's one to um, really keep an eye on. I think this, this conversation is really going to evolve over the next couple of years and hopefully we're going to get some great solutions. Um, so um, let's see, a couple more questions rolling in here. To what extent does your board make these decisions before hiring a GM? Ooh, this is such a good one. And it's kind of a tough one, right? So, so in JQ, if you have insights here, please feel free to jump in. Um, because this is something that we've actually seen firsthand. It's a, it can be a little sticky, right? Because the work takes time in advance, right? So if you're programming a prepared foods department, you're starting that work, you know, maybe a full year, maybe more ahead of when the stores open. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a GM. So um, some of those choices that need to be made are going to happen with the board. And some of them are safe, right? It's safe to kind of make these decisions. And then some, it's difficult because there's a group that's making a decision that ultimately another person is going to have to execute and work with. Uh, JQ, I see you unmuted yourself. Yeah. So please. I do want to jump in here because this has actually been an ongoing problem for lots of years. Nicole and I have been talking about it for years. Um, we've been through it with many of <laughs> startup together. And so I would like to take this option to say, especially right now, here's the deal. If your GM is not already on staff and probably will not be, when you're having to make programming decisions so you can make design decisions, so they're designed the right store, then you need to bring, you need to find an expert you trust. I strongly recommend bringing an expert you trust who has a track record in, in creating specifically deli programs and do the work, get it done, have it designed by an expert who knows you're talking about and make sure that GM's hired under the understanding that we wish you'd been here at that point, that wasn't possible, but we're expecting you to stick to 85% of this plan. You have the equipment you have. Um, and I think if you do it with expertise that you can really rely on, uh, and there's lots of sources. There was well, not a lot. There's a couple sources for that, <laughs> multiple sources for that. You can reach out to me about uh, some contacts for that. You you cannot wait around for the GM, nor can you have the GM changing programs where we're changing out expensive equipment. And very few of your GMs are going to come in as deli experts. Uh, not, strangely, a lot of GMs usually come out of produce. There's not so many of us that came out of deli. Um, so you, you're better off relying on the experts. And most GMs would be thrilled to be handed a well thought out plan and to know who to call about what they were thinking to finish the rest. That's my yeah. opinion. Yeah, and I would say like when you're programming to, your professionals are gonna work with you on why they're doing the things that they're doing, right? And so they should be able to walk you through their plan, walk you through why they chose what they chose, whether it's equipment or labor or menu programming, all of it should be tailored to exactly your specifications. Um, I will point out that it, it's not a restaurant. It's very different than, than a restaurant. So people that have restaurant experience often, you know, think they can go back and forth, but I'd be like, I don't know, I couldn't design, you know, a restaurant. Um, and they might not be able to help you in that area too. So make sure that it's someone that has worked with grocery store operations, um, food co-ops in particular, uh, just because our distribution and supply chain is so different than non um, natural and organic products. So just really reaching out to the peers that you have and, and getting some support would be critical. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, and there's a big relationship piece too at the end, but I know we're running out of time here. So let's try to get at the ones that we have. We have a couple. Um, Kevin, couple is your questions. store doing self-serve salads? Yes, we are. All right. All right, feel free to reach out for self-serve. Mm, all right, cool. So feel free, Chris, reach out to Kevin if you have like specific questions on that, just so we can pop over to some of these other questions. Um, um, I don't, I, I don't think we're aware of any innovation labs or hubs that are looking at environmentally better packaging, at least specific for grocery at this point that's on our radar. So I'm sure someone's out there working on it, but, but we're not seeing anything yet. 
right? Yeah. That's being within our sort of distribution lines and whatnot. Yeah. And how important is it to, to have a see-through container for grab and go? We have cardboard paper packages. Does that impact appeal on the shelf and impact sales? I'm so excited about this question. Um, <laughs> It's important. It is truly important. So I was actually just working with someone earlier this year and they had these amazing they're chocolate chip cookies. Actually, it's a theme. Right. And um, they were selling them in 12 packs and they were using those paper pie boxes. They shifted from using the plastic clamshells because, you know, everyone everyone wants to shift away from plastic to the pie boxes and then they were up on a shelf. So you could see the sticker and it said 12 pack chocolate chip cookies. But at eye level, most people weren't seeing in the window to see the, the cookies and sales dropped. And so I, and I had brought it up. I said, you know, that's really a terrible presentation. Anyway, the point is they moved them and they, they moved them so they were more visible and, uh, they're selling a lot more cookies now. And that's true of all this stuff, right? So like, if you see a beautiful salad, you're going to be a lot more inclined to pick it up. And, and it's just, for that matter, if you have like food that you're selling that's glop, maybe you do want that in a different package, right? With a beautiful label. <laughs> but it's, it's a really, it's a really big selling point and you're already putting the work into producing gorgeous food. So you shouldn't cover it up you should let it be its gorgeous self and sell itself. That's yeah. a big one. It's free marketing. All right. So, oh, there's another question here. All right, we're going for it. Uh, Some places have seen that the JQ says the work in, ooh, that work in sandwiches this will though. Say wrap, so the wrapping of sandwiches, I have seen brown wax paper wrapping for sandwiches. I know that my home co-op uses it. It doesn't seem to have affected sales, but maybe I'm just being silly. But around sandwiches, I've seen it work. I don't know what yeah. Usually I would say because yeah, it's, it, it's a it, sandwich it, shape, right? Like they know that it's a sandwich. Whereas if you have a box and it's on a top shelf, you don't know what it is, even if it says cookies. And so I think that things that are like constantly moving and like everyday products um, are a little bit different. We're finding places to wedge it in there. I guess what I wanted to say is, Close are experimenting with this. We're finding some places where it does work. There's new packaging coming all the time. We're looking into it. So I don't want to sound like no one, because I know everyone here cares about this deeply. We've just been in the fight against plastic for a long time. And what we know is consumers don't buy things that they can't see. So we would love to be moving <laughs> to cardboard boxes. And we were seeing it with strawberries. We're seeing it with berries. You know, it, there's places this is starting to happen. And, and maybe there are some spots, there's inroads for this, but it's evolving. Yeah. Yes, Thank absolutely. you. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, all right, so that's it. We're at time. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. This was great. It was awesome to kind of see your faces, see you in the chat. That was really lovely. Um, you can reach us anytime. Uh, we love these kinds of conversations, freakishly, maybe. Um, so uh, info at sevenrootsgroup.com. You, you can kind of feel free to, to reach out if you want to talk about this or any other things. And we were really glad to be with you today. So again, we're gonna stick around for a few minutes after. So if you wanna just chit chat, feel free to stay here with us. Thank you guys so, so much. Big round of applause for Seven Roots team for donating their time today to talk with all of us. Loved that session. They always bring great energy. They are gonna stay a few minutes after. So if you still have questions and you wanna talk about them, once the recording stopped, we can do that. Uh, I just wanted to real quickly thank them and say there is one more session left in FCI Live's fall series, and that's later this afternoon, just an hour from now, making your co-op loan ready with the experts from uh, Shared Capital Cooperative. And this one's a really, I think, a really interesting one. You get to talk to a lender about what they're looking for in your application, what'll fly, what won't, ask all these questions in a very... Um, like non-confrontational, non-risk-based situation. You're not asking them to be your lender. You're asking them to give you a window into what lenders' brains think. And they're gonna be here to do that. Uh, you guys requested this one. I hope some of you will join us. And last but not least, we cannot close the session without thanking those who made this possible. We'd like to thank the USDA Rural Development, National Cooperative Bank, National Cooperative Grocers, and CoBank for making this uh, whole series possible and sponsoring it. You guys rock. And with that, I am going to stop our recording and you can continue to talk to some of our speakers if you would like.